Just the name brings back memories. Images of flooded streets, battered homes, and families displaced. In the age of social media, hurricanes bring tweets, posts, and viral conspiracy theories. We've all seen the headlines. Government hiding true strength of Milton. Welcome to The Awakening, Black Women United. I am your host, Sherry Danny. Subscribe, like, share, comment, and hit the notification bell so you know every time I upload a new video. October 9th. As Hurricane Milton barreled toward Florida's Gulf Coast on Wednesday, conspiracy theories about officials controlling the weather have surfaced online. More than one million people have been ordered to evacuate in Florida's Gulf Coast, a region still recovering from Hurricane Helene, which battered the U.S. Southeast at the end of September. Here are some of the key narratives gaining traction online. Claim. Hurricanes are a product of weather control, what we know. Several online posts, including one from Republican U.S. Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, have suggested weather control was at play during the hurricanes. In an ex-post on Octane 3, Greene said, Yes, they can control the weather. It's ridiculous for anyone to lie and say it can't be done. Experts in hurricane meteorology told readers that hurricane modification has never been possible due to the size and power of the storms. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration experimented, opening a new tab with cloud seeding of hurricanes between the 1960s and 1980s in the hope of reducing the strength of their winds, but concluded it didn't work. It also I'm out here on the balcony just above where you are, and I'm looking out at the incredible scene we're He's watching coming. unfold Tom's in front of our eyes right now. Vi vinyl siding being ripped off uh, from different structures out here in Sarasota. A storm. Uh, for this region. And you can see why the really, really heavy rains, the purples, the reds are all kind of centered and sitting over that area. Yes, the system's moving 15, 16 miles per hour over the past couple of hours, but not fast enough to kind of get folks that have already been sitting in this part. It also found that the size and power of a hurricane made this process, as well as other techniques considered over the years, infeasible. Green's office did not immediately return a request for comment a University of Alaska Fairbanks program that was managed by the U.S. military between 1990 to 2014 uses high-frequency equipment to study the upper atmosphere. Conspiracy theories about HARP, formerly called the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program, accuse governments of using the program to secretly alter the weather or tie the program to natural disasters. A spokesperson for HARP told Reuters, HARP can't create, modify, or manipulate a hurricane. Howard Diamond, a director at NOAA's Air Resources Laboratory, said in an email that HARP has absolutely no connection to the formation of hurricanes like Helene or Milton. Neither HARP nor any facility can affect hurricanes. And there is no technology that humans have that can either create, destroy, modify, intensify, or steer hurricanes in any way, shape, or form, he added. As Hurricane Milton bears down on Florida, some of the dialogue on social media includes baseless theories that the storm has been geoengineered, that the government is involved in hurricane creation, and that such storms are being directed to hit predominantly Republican areas. Stayed here. Um, we've only seen, based on our NBC News count, at least 17 apparent reported tornadoes. National Guard flying through the gale wind force. That, uh, it's amazing what they're doing. Firefighters lifting collapsed wood and metal. An attempt to get to see if there are survivors, any survivors under the debris, risking their lives. Coast Guard teams repelling from helicopters to rescue people and risking their own lives. And there are countless friends. Now, and then from a home camera today, look at this. Trees whipping around as an apparent tornado blew through in Fort Myers. We're going to take you there live in just a second. Some of these twisters have even hit the other side of the state, like in Martin County. Look at that wind flipping a trailer, snapping tree areas. Not only is that absurd, it's frustrating, said Amber Silver, an assistant professor at the University at Albany's College of Emergency Preparedness, Homeland Security and Cybersecurity. It's just an example of the series of false claims and conspiracy theories that have accompanied Milton, which is expected to make landfall late Wednesday or early Thursday, and Hurricane Helene, which also hit Florida and other southeastern U.S. states two weeks ago and it's misinformation and disinformation that officials say has resulted in hampering the relief and recovery efforts. It is the worst I have ever seen, FEMA Administrator Deanne Criswell told reporters on a Tuesday morning call as reported by Politico. 
It's creating distrust in the federal government, but also the state government. And we have so many first responders that have been working to go out and help these communities. I have covered some of the conspiracy theories on the origins of hurricanes and Helene and Milton in particular. However, the honorable comedian and civil rights activist Dick Gregory had his own esoteric and spiritual theory on the origins of hurricanes or hurricanes. Before I let you hear Dick's theory affectionately known as Baba Dick Gregory, let me give you some background on him. Gregory was at the forefront of political activism in the 1960s when he protested against the Vietnam War and racial injustice and advocated for animal rights. He was arrested multiple times and went on many hunger strikes. He later became a speaker and author. Gregory died of heart failure, aged 84, at a Washington, D.C. hospital in August 2017. Richard Claxton Gregory, October 12, 1932, August 19, 2017, was an American comedian, actor, writer, activist, and social critic. His books were bestsellers. Gregory became popular among the African-American communities in the Southern United States with his No Holds Barred sets, poking fun at the bigotry and racism in the United States. In 1961, he became a staple in the comedy clubs, appeared on television, and released comedy record albums. In the winter of 1963, white authorities cut off commodities in Lafleur and Sunflower counties, where SNCC was making its biggest effort in Mississippi. The optional federal government program permitted poor counties to receive surplus government food or commodities for distribution to the poor. In the sharecropped cotton plantation land of the Delta, this food was vital to making it through the winter. SNCC put out a national call for food. When Dick Gregory heard about the surplus food cutoff, he chartered a plane and sent 14,000 pounds of food to Greenwood. This was a first step that would lead the renowned comedian into increasingly deeper involvement with the Southern Civil Rights Movement. Both the surplus food cutoff and Gregory's relief, noted Bob Moses, enabled many for the first time to see clearly the connection between political participation and food on their table. SNCC staff handed out food and voter registration forms. In the spring, SNCC organizers invited Gregory to speak at a mass meeting in Greenwood. The community had never heard a black man speak publicly in the manner that Gregory did. He made fun of the police, calling them a bunch of illiterate whites who couldn't even pass the test themselves. Gregory also called out the local preachers, reluctant to involve themselves with the movement and said, these handkerchief heads don't realize this area is going to break. If you have to pray in the street, it's better than worshiping with a man who is less than a man. The meeting erupted into laughter and applause. A week later, 31 ministers signed a statement in support of the voting rights drive. Gregory did not flinch from putting himself in the path of danger. Once in a mass meeting in Clarksdale, Mississippi, a bomb was tossed through a window and people started rushing towards the door. Gregory grabbed the microphone and said, where are you going? The man who threw it is outside God's house. The man who's supposed to save you lives here. Someone picked up the bomb and threw it back outside and the meeting continued. The Clarksdale police chief denied that his officers were responsible for the bomb. If one of our men threw that bomb, he said, you'd better believe it would have gone off. Gregory was constantly speaking to white authorities in startling, unexpected ways. During the protests in Greenwood, a police officer dragged Gregory across the street. Thanks a million, Gregory told him. Up north, police don't escort me across the street. On another occasion, he wagged his finger in the faces of white policemen gathered in front of the county courthouse. Now let's hear from a man of wisdom whom I never met but who has forever transformed my life by his courage and knowledge, the sometimes forgotten elder Dick Gregory. Black woman, Thanks. hurricanes, that's the black woman. That's her spirit, white folk know that, the real ones, and we don't. All hurricanes start at the exact spot in West Africa where the slaves was put on the ship. Not almost, the, the right area! Well, slaves was put on the ship. That's where hurricanes started. They stay on the water and follow the same route the slave ship followed. No slave was offloaded the ship till it got to the Caribbean. Hmm? <laughs> no hurricane jumps above water till it get to the Caribbean. Hit this country and come all the way up the east coast to Maine. 
Maine is as close to Canada as you are to me. Canada has never had a hurricane because Canada never messed with a sister like America has to get their turn snort and go back out. Dick Gregory. Thinking about what Baba Dick Gregory said is the cause of hurricanes, let's look at Florida's slavery and Jim Crow history, the gut-wrenching history of black babies and alligators. It's not a myth. Babies were used to luring gators and crocodiles to hunting. Baits alligators with piccaninnies, reads a Washington Times headline on June 3, 1908. The article continues. Zoo specimens coaxed to summer quarters by plump little Africans. The New York Zoological Garden's zookeeper sent two black children into an enclosure that housed more than 25 crocodiles and alligators. The hungry reptiles chased the children, entertaining zoo patrons while leading the alligators and crocodiles out of the reptile house, where they spent the winter, into a tank where they could be viewed during the summer. The newspaper article states, two small black children happened to drift through the reptile house. The zookeeper pressed them into service. He believed that alligators and crocodiles had an epicurean fondness for the black man. He also believed, along with all the people who allowed it to happen, that the lives of those sons were nearly valueless. There is no mention of punishment for the zookeeper in the 166-word article. The children were chased by the hungry reptiles, entertaining zoo patrons while leading the alligators and crocodiles out of the reptile house, where they spent the winter, into a tank where they could be viewed during the summer. According to the newspaper article, two small black children happened to drift through the reptile house. The zookeeper pressed them into service. He believed that alligators and crocodiles had an epicurean fondness for the black man. He also believed, along with all the people who allowed it to happen, that the lives of those sons were nearly valueless. There is no mention of punishment for the zookeeper in the 166-word article. It offers not one adjective that would imply that the actions of the zookeeper were despicable, unthinkable, or even reckless. Was using black children as gator bait unacceptable? No. Unbelievably no. The idea that black children are acceptable gator bait was not born in the head of one zookeeper. It was a practice in the American Everglades that inspired lore and occasioned memorabilia. In 1923, Time magazine reported that black American babies were being used for alligator bait in Chipley, Florida. The infants are allowed to play in the shallow water while expert riflemen watch from concealment nearby. When a saurian approaches this prey, he is shot by the riflemen. This tactic was more humane than the one described in a Miami New Times article. Alligator hunters would sit crying black babies who were too young to walk at the water's edge. With a rope around their necks and waists, the babies would splash and cry until a crocodile snapped on one of them. The hunters would kill the alligator only after the baby was in its jaws, trading one child's life for one alligator's skin. They made postcards, pictures, and trinkets to commemorate the practice. In October 1919, the Richmond Times-Dispatch printed what appears to have been a joke titled, Game Protection. It reads, We understand the Florida authorities are going to prohibit the use of live pickaninnies as alligator bait. They say they've got to do something to check the rapid disappearance of the alligator through indigestion. A Minnesota paper, the New Ulm Review, printed an article in January 1922 previewing the attractions at the Brown County Fair. In the section about fireworks, the article boasted that there will also be a big colored alligator pursuing a fleeing piccaninny and many other beautiful designs. In October 1902, the St. Louis Republic described all of the floats in the city's veiled prophet parade. A secret society founded by a former Confederate soldier, the Veiled Prophet Organization held a parade to tell the history of the Louisiana Purchase. Float number 15 was called Plantation Life in Louisiana. It displayed a monstrous alligator swallowing a fat piccaninny. Some believe the abundance of memorabilia, jokes, and celebrations to be inspired by fiction, not actual events. But it almost doesn't matter. These events are but a droplet in the swamp that is the mafa. Derived from the Swahili term meaning great disaster, in English, Mafa has come to represent a history of offenses and ongoing effects of horrors inflicted on black American people. Beginning with the transporting of Africans to America to enslave them, the American Mafa is rife with dehumanizing violence. Crammed in a ship's hull for months, 
African people lay shoulder to shoulder in excrement. The people who died of illness were thrown overboard and attacked by sharks who had learned to follow the ships for an easy meal. Destined for a fate as cruel, the Africans who survived the journey endured further physical and psychological destruction. Separated from their families, branded, dismembered, castrated, and assaulted. Those are wrongs that cannot be righted, brutalities never grieved, atrocities ignored and mockingly memorialized as recently as the 1960s by a pencil pusher depicting a black baby in the mouth of an alligator. The Christian people responsible for centuries of Mafa justified their sins by convincing themselves that blacks were an inferior race. This has been The Awakening, Black Women United. I am your host, Sherry Donnie. Subscribe, like, share, comment, and hit the notification bell so you know every time I upload a new video. What do you believe causes the hurricanes? Comment below and let me know. Remember, in the aftermath of a disaster, the only thing more powerful than a hurricane is the collective will of a community united. 